Hi, everyone. It's Ravi, aka the Junior Explorer, and I'm here with a special guest to the channel, Jonathan Buick of Champion Electric Metals. Now, before I introduce Jonathan and discuss some ex some of the exciting things going on at Champion, I wanted to provide the viewers uh, some insight on how the company got on my radar and why I added it to my lithium portfolio and why I consider it one of my top three lithium junior explorers. So let's rewind to about six months ago. I was in the beginning stages of creating a large database of lithium juniors, uh, which at the time was about 100 plus companies. And part of my process was to plug them into this tracker system that I developed uh, to help me determine which ones require a little bit more investigations in the hopes of getting a multi-bag return. One of the first companies that popped up on this radar was Idaho Champion. At the time, they had announced an acquisition of, of two claims in James Bay, just north of Patriot Battery Metals, uh, the Blanche and Charles. And with a five cent stock price and a market cap around 10 million, I was like, you know, this sounds kind of interesting, but there are a few things that I really wanted to see before I considered, you know, adding it to my my portfolio. So over a one to two month period of researching, checking out geological maps, the digi uh, data, and a number of other things, I kept seeing all these news releases is coming from Champion that just, in my opinion, checked a lot of the boxes. So it actually prompted me to pick up the phone and cold call the CEO. And uh, to my amazement, uh, I got hold of Jonathan on a, a Friday afternoon, and he was kind enough to take the call, even though it sounded like he was driving. I heard the uh, turn signals a couple of times, and uh, you know he was able to, again, answer a lot of my questions. So, And if you're wondering who sought out who for this interview, it was actually me that asked Jonathan if he can find a few minutes to talk about Champion Electric Metals, uh, because I believe it's one of the lithium juniors to watch in 2023 and 2024. So... With that, I'd like to welcome uh, Jonathan Buick to the show. Jonathan, my apologies for keeping you waiting. I thought it'd be helpful to pro provide a little bit of background on my journey of becoming a champion shareholder, and I hope this is one of many more interviews to come. So welcome. Sure. Thank you, Ravi, and uh, welcome as a shareholder and partner. I know I know we've spoken a couple of times, but certainly I think it's important to, to acknowledge that you have a lot of choices and to pick to align yourself and join us on our journey is is an, is an important decision for you and one we respect and appreciate. So, so welcome and glad to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. So before we get into a bit of your background, I was hoping you can give my audience a brief overview of the board members. Uh, I refer you and uh, the team as the dream team as it, it relates to, to lithium. As I understand, this group has been, been, been involved in successful lithium assets uh, of over $6 billion in market cap. So if you can just give us a little bit of a brief overview. Sure. I, I'm going to say right out of the gate, I, I'm going to talk as an investor because we're all investors. I think it's important for, for anybody that's considering an investment to, to, to know and understand what we, what we do and what we, what we bring uh, in addition to our skill set, but also we've, we've, we've aligned with the shareholder. Um, we write checks, every financing, it's about respecting the capital at the end of the day people need to understand and i think often juniors forget that we work for the shareholder and so the shareholder matters it's about being available and accountable uh when we look at assets for acquisition uh we want we want assets that we can actually lead to a mining decision so when i speak about my team as, a, as an investor i bet 98 of my decision is tied to the people i want to invest in a group that's done it before I'm not. I don't want. I don't want a better rookie. If we use a champion uh, reference, and uh, you know, I don't want to back somebody. It's the first time. I want somebody who's done this. Have you made people money before? Uh, and that's an important criteria for me. And I also want to see insider ownership. Uh, and so I'm going to now speak to our team. So I'll start with Patrick Highsmith. He is somebody I've known for a long time. He is a technical director. He's American. He's worked with Newmont, BHP, Fortescue, as well as well as a, a number of juniors. He's, he's a, a great asset. When he was with Newmont, he was responsible for joint ventures into the juniors. So he knows how the big companies behave and operate and what their, their end goal is. So he's good at helping us stick handle that conversation as those conversations occur. He is uh, the former CEO and director of Lithium One. He hired my firm at a, my own banking firm called Harp Capital. He hired my, my firm in 2010 to seek a partner out of Korea and Japan. We brought him a, a joint venture with LG, GS, Caltex, and Caress into the Sal de Vida project in Argentina. And about 15 months later, they were taken out by Galaxy Minerals, now all kept. The, the project at Sal de Vida is in construction. 
their second project that they had that was their flagship in Quebec was called Sear at the time, and it's now called James Bay Lithium, also owned by Alchem with the merger with F with uh, Livent. So those two projects are both uh, either in construction or, or about to break ground. And so those are, that's an important thing for any investor to understand is that's that's how we move projects is that, to those decisions. Paul Fornazari is a founder of Idaho Champion, now Champion Electric Metals. He was also a founder and director for Lithium Americas. He also served as chairman in, on that company for, for a period of time. He left that company and, and started Neo Lithium. And when he left Lithium Americas, I, I, I would, it was probably about a $3 billion market cap. So they went from a, a private to a $3 billion, And now I think they're closer to $6 billion. Neo Lithium was a, a, a startup uh, that went from private again to being taken out last February. So February 2022 for $940 million. So again, major wins for the shareholder. He is a, a securities lawyer by, by by training. He's a senior partner at Faskins in Toronto, but he's also a serial entrepreneur, and, and he understands structure and 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 how to put together uh, the the legal framework that allows us to be successful, no matter what jurisdiction we're in. Gabriel Pindar is a, our newest director, engineer by training. He's built eleven or been involved in building eleven mines around the world, including one in Quebec. He worked with Arcelor in their iron ore business in Quebec for a period of time. And so he understands the jurisdiction. He'll, he knows how to get things done in Quebec. He was a, the COO and director for Neo Lithium. Uh, he, he is somebody that with that sale of the company took a bit of time off to try to figure out what and how he wanted to participate going forward. So he put us sort of through an interview process to see if we qualified for, for his time and his capital. And by Christmas time and turn of the year, we had checked enough of the boxes for him to be willing to to join the board. Not only did he uh, put his hand up to join the board, but he said, I want to own 10% of the company. I said, well, we're not selling 10% at this price. We're too cheap. But I said, you know, we, we're all shareholders of size and we want you to be a shareholder size so you, you can participate in the next financing. Uh, that wasn't good enough. He didn't want to wait for the next financing. So he actually stroked a seven-figure check coming in the front door. And as one of my large shareholders said, uh, if that's not a flex, I don't know what is. <laughs> Subsequent to that first check in the first quarter, about three weeks ago, we announced a financing at a premium. Our, at the time, our stock was 10 cents, and we did a financing at 13. Uh, and that was Gabrielle putting another seven figures in. We wanted to send a message to the market that we think we're undervalued right now. We also want to own enough stock that if a hostile bid was to come, that we can protect ourselves, and we can dictate the terms of when that transaction happens and with who. So that was an important message twofold. One, to let the shareholder and investor know, wow, they really think this is cheap if they're paying that premium, but also to let anybody that's been tracking us corporately to know it's not going to come easy. Good stuff. And can you tell me uh, a little bit about your background and area of expertise? My background's capital markets. Uh, I've worked in the in the uh, capital markets, both in the UK and in, in Canada. My, my entire career, I've been doing this for, I don't want to age myself, but over 30 years. Uh, have, I have my own broker dealer. Uh, it's uh, now I've, my, I've handed that off the keys to that off to my partner. So Harp Capital still exists within Harp. We've raised over a half a billion dollars now for junior mining companies, and four of those were battery metals transactions where I acted as the advisor with the issuer to get capital out of Korea. Those were uh, tied to the big Korean battery groups, so we know who that end user audience is. And, and what their motivations are and how they how they try to structure a deal and the pace of how they move through a deal. So we do have, between us as a board, the big company experience, transactions, either as the junior or the big company, knowing who the institutional ownership uh, participants would be, but also who the, the, the end game is in terms of aligning yourselves for offtake and, and joint venture. So we've got a lot of pieces to the puzzle in place. We are still speaking to other potential board candidates. We do still want to continue to add bench strength from the battery metals space and our and our Rolodex of people. Part of, I think, the next appointment would be tied to an additional listing. We are seeking additional listings. We, we want to be able to access a pool of capital and, and an audience of investors who are keen on lithium, but also really have fallen in love with the James Bay region, and that's the Australian stock market. So we will be pursuing that as a corporate goal this year. Uh, and so with that, you need to have a a resident Australian. So that that's the next possible candidate that would be coming onto the team. Awesome. So let's uh let's get into a little bit of the uh the recent news. So I'm just gonna go a little bit back in time. So around uh beginning of November, so November eleventh, 
uh, you acquired uh, some prospective lithium projects. That was the, the Blanche and Charles. And um, things seem to have gone pretty quickly. So it's pretty remarkable. And in, in less than six months, you've gone from two projects to this large, massive set of claims that total over um, 500 square kilometers. So uh, can you talk a little bit about... Um, you know, what drew you to these two projects, the Blanche and Charles, and uh, why it was important to kind of establish these initially as, as flagship projects? Yeah, that, that map takes me back and it feels longer ago. It, it looks like such a naked map compared to the land package we have now. Uh, as a board in November of 2021, I went to the board and at that point I'd started to be getting in, inundated by Aussie corporates that were trying to raid us, not for lithium because we didn't have anything announced at that point but they were trying to see if we would be interested in divesting our cobalt properties in Idaho and so I, I it wasn't just one group there was a half a dozen groups that were pretty persistent and all of our board's background like Patrick was on the board already Paul was already on the board like we were already talking about offsetting jurisdictional risk because we're Idaho centric at that time but if we're going to go to go in another jurisdiction maybe we should be considering battery metals I reached out to my partner from Harp, who has been basically uh, redomiciled to Korea for the last four years since the, the start of COVID, and reached out to him and said, do you think there's an audience with the battery groups for our early stage COBOL? He said, don't don't transact. Let's see if we can get something done. So we started having different conversations, came back to the board, said, listen, we've been, as a, as a junior who raises money in Canadian dollars, we immediately get punished by the FX turn changing that into us dollars to go spend in idaho what if we tried a, a multi-pronged approach where we try to get one of the battery groups whether it's korean or, or japanese to earn in and spend the us dollars in idaho and we see if we can pick up some lithium projects or nickel projects in quebec and then we can raise flow through at a premium and then we can manage the dilution better because again we're thinking as a shareholder and an investor like dilution matters to us they 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 said well if you can, if you can find stuff then let, let's let's pursue pursue those so I went through a bunch of companies that I'd raised money in the past or new directors from companies I'd raised money in the past. For us, infrastructure, without infrastructure, like if, if the road, if that trans road wasn't there and the power lines weren't there, we, we wouldn't have bought this ground. We know how hard it is to work remote and we, we want to be able to, to remove risk. Our, our Part of our job is, is to reduce risk wherever we can. And so the road being there, the power lines being there, LG4 Airport being there, Mirage Base Camps being there helped us check a lot of those boxes. We also think as a junior and we, with the company that we did that transaction with, this was a project that was in their inventory. They had a discovery in a different part of Quebec. They had a major spending money on that. I approached them and said, look, I, I, I knew two of the directors for close to 18 years. I said, this is just sitting in your inventory of land. Why not let us monetize it and make you a, a, a cornerstone shareholder and, and you can see the benefit for your shareholders by us actually advancing those assets. So that's how we came to Blanche and Charles. We started that conversation early, early last year. Took awesome. us through the spring and into the, into the, into the fall. We announced it in September, but we had already started having multiple conversations with multiple prospectors. As you can imagine, there was a lot of different loose pieces of ground around. And so we were trying to uh, increase the land packages. Our geos did deeper and deeper dives, said, look, we need to get more ground. We flew the project in November, came back and, and there's like, we definitely need to get more ground. So our strategy always is we don't want to have stranded assets. That's why we want that trans road there. But also we want to be contiguous because we know if you make a discovery, you want to be able to control as much of the, the ground as possible. We didn't want to have any gaps that we'd have to come back and fill later because our experience before this was prospectors ride the sign curve of the metal price. And certainly here, it's no different. And the, the share price appreciation of Patriot changed their ask constantly mm -hmm. it was a move the the the, the uh the, it was a moving target every time there'd be a, a, a the next conversation the ask would change it was a, it was a, a i would say a challenge set of conversations and then you add in language uh, i had a couple of key shareholders who are francophone and, and helped with a couple of conversations because they were uh my french is I can read a menu. And I can understand what you're telling me, but you don't want me negotiating in French. Yeah, my, I know my core language is English and businesses typically do uh, transactions in English, but for a few of the prospectors, English wasn't a choice. So uh, I was able to 
to uh, utilize some my my Quebec shareholders to help with those conversations. So uh, it's been a, a, a team effort, including with shareholders, to, to to do what we've been able to do. Awesome. So let's kind of fast forward uh, two months from then to the beginning of this year. Uh, you completed your work program on those projects, and part of that work program was, you know, high resolution magnetic, some electromagnetic, uh, lidar. Now I've heard different arguments for not doing mag surveys, such as lithium not being responsive to magnetics. Why, in your opinion, was this work important, and how did it help laying the framework for potentially, as you mentioned, growing the land land package? So the the government of Quebec has been really good at what gathering information i i think it's probably the the best jurisdiction in the world uh the, the, in between 1970 and 1978 they actually flew the entire province and where they saw things that were of interest they actually went and put boots on the ground and then if they saw something interesting from that they would even throw a, a drill hole in so there there's a, a a library of data that the province has it's unique and, and tough to compare it with in terms of other jurisdictions. So we started combing through that and peeling back the onion. And when you start to layer that, and that's, you know, we, we started a major desktop study while we were e even in negotiations, but we were reviewing the regional land, not just the ground we controlled at that time, because we knew these ongoing conversations. And and uh, within the desktop study, we, we'd take that library of data. We were then supplementing that with spectral satellite imagery that's third party owned, and, and available to anybody we had had our own data that, from what we had flown and we started from our data we could start to better understand things but at the same time we were also seeing live data coming from our neighbor at patriot which was helping us on un, unfold and unlock our our knowledge of the geologic structures of which we're in the geologic event that created that greenstone belt is the same one it was the same event that created can't set for Winsome and Corvette for Patriot is what we see on our ground. So we expect to see similar types of results. It, it's same rock units, same same rock structures. We wanted to get as much ground once we saw how that greenstone was. We also know the greenstone belt that and, and how Quebec has, has, has mapped, there's often gaps. So we think there might even be more greenstone belt that's already than, than has been documented historically because those are those, that's that's stale data. And that's why it's important for us to have our own boots on the ground. We 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 need to be gathering and capturing our own data set that is to our standard because we have expectations and, and and standards amongst our team as to what we want to see and how that gets received and how we deliver that into uh, our geologic model. You know, like we think at Corvette, our geos have done it in Leapfrog. They think that's a hundred million ton plus deposit at about one point four to one point five percent. That's a world class deposit. That will be a mine. I think Canset will be a mine. Canset may even be earlier because it's an open pit at surface. They don't have to deal with the being the deposit being under a lake. This is going to be a multi-mine jurisdiction in the next hundred years. This is literally its infancy, and and to have a chance to come in and play a meaningful role is is in a really dynamic system is is really exciting for our team. Like our team is full speed right now. It's it's um it's it's amazing to watch and and they see and hear the energy from them. Perfect. And this leads in nicely to some of the more recent news. So January 25th, you uh, entered an agreement to add some additional claims. So back to what for me, check the box was a contiguous land package and kind of owning everything along that, uh, that uh, little geological area. And then if I move, um, so I kind of highlighted, you know, 522 claims covering 283 square kilometers contiguous. And then March 2nd, uh, you acquired some additional claims, an extra 266. So now controlling over 412 uh, square kilometers. And if I go to just a month ago, uh, you added some additional claims. So now almost 846 claims covering 432 square kilometers. And then fast forward um, a few weeks ago, uh, now totaling 980 claims and over 500 square kilometers. That is pretty amazing in such a short time. And just from a, a size of, of land, um, 
clearly, if I look at this map here, it seems like you're probably twice the size of, of Patriot. Is that kind of a fair assessment in terms of, of size of what you currently have? So we're, we are nine transactions in 500 plus square kilometers of, of contiguous ground. Patriot is at it's 216 or 218 square kilometers and Winsome is 200 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. So we are more than double Patriot. We're, we're two and a half times bigger than Winsome. But if you even combine the two together, we still have an extra 85 kilometers. But if you put those two land packages together now, ground is ground until you prove it's valuable. But I know when it's early days, a lot of times people do a per claim valuation as they try to put a model around something that doesn't have a drill hole in it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, don't, I don't hold that to any standard, but I know I can tell you what the going rate is for claims because we've tracked that. And in the last 24 months, as we've had the equivalent of the Klondike gold rush in this part of the James Bay, the average claim has been going for over $10,000 a claim. Wow. Our average cost acquisition cost has been 2,400. So we think we've got good value in the transactions. Now, not all that ground is going to be fertile. There will be some barren ground, but we, we have so much work to do and so many targets that we've already generated with the boots on the ground, but confirming what we've seen from the historic reports. We know we've got lithium showings. We know we got exposed pegmatites. It's going to be a busy spring and summer. And, and, and the advantage we have is multiple over a lot of the other guys that have come into the camp. You know, that access to infrastructure is crucial. It's the lifeblood of a successful program, but also the lifeblood of your treasury. If you're not on that road, you're doing everything remote by helicopter. You you can put it, whatever you think you're going to spend, it, put a put a, a multiplication sign around it. It's not just a plus sign, it's a multiplication sign. It, it gets expensive fast. And and so we, 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 were, we think we've been strategic in what we've acquired. We may have bought some stuff we didn't need or people don't understand what we did. But even if you look at that acquisition in March, March 2nd, that shows that was, I think, blue a couple of slides ago, that's all along our northern flank. Yeah, that one. So if you look along that northern flank, what you see there, you see a river that runs right across, or a lake that runs right across the top of that. Well, there was a, and but I had a, a technical shareholder pull me up and say, well, why would you buy that? That's in the granites. It's not in the greenstone. I said, okay, well, if, if, I, if I answered everybody who questions every decision we make, I'd have no time to actually do my job. But I thought, this is worth talking about. We, we, we saw a number of companies that were coming in for the benefit of being able to just promote ground in the James Bay. And that's the nature of this business, right? It's closeology. Like now there's a Corvette East, a Corvette West, a Corvette North, a Corvette. You know, there are more Corvettes in James Bay now than there ever was at a car dealership. And you've got Mercedes and Hummer and all these different plays on, on, on that. That's not our game. We're, we're, what I said at the house, we're here to make a discovery that's going to lead to a mining decision. So that northern flank protects us, gave us an extra buffer from the, the promoters that were coming in. But it also gave us access to an extra transportation corridor. If you're a geologist and you're doing a spring sampling program, you're going to you're going to be in the bush and you're going to come out with about 20 or 30 kilos of rock at the end of the day. If you look at the swamp and bog that you're working through up here, you're maybe covering two kilometers a day. Just, you can't do it. You can't move. So this spring, our program, we have access to that road with our trucks. We've got a helicopter for the program so we can bring our crew in and out and bring the samples in and out uh, every day. They're going to be dropping them off in different parts of the ground. But now we also have that transportation corridor of that lake. We can run Zodiac inflatables with outboard motors and run people and, and rock up and down there back up towards the airport area. And, and it just allows greater access quicker. And so that was another reason why we went after that ground. And yeah, the, 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 my Cheryl is right that all the, all the big discoveries in James Bay have been in the Greenstone, but that's because that's where the most historic work has been done. We know there's pegmatites within the granites. And that could be a game changer for everybody, not just us. If all of a sudden you get a a, 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 a pregnant a, or a lithium bearing spodumene pegmatite within the granites, because that changes the whole kaleidoscope of opportunity for everybody. But yeah. I'm not no geologist. Yeah, I'm not a geologist, but um, if I recall, as reading one of the Australian geological surveys, and these large 
uh, deposits such as green bushes, those were in older rocks, not not in greenstone uh, rocks there. So definitely, I, th I think there's uh, far more lithium discoveries that are going to be made and stuff that are not just only greenstone uh, belts there. So sure. I'm going to fast forward to uh, yeah. May 16, and uh, you completed uh, the desktop survey and uh, identified some high priority uh, pegmatites. Uh, can you kind of walk uh, the the viewers a little bit through you know a desktop study. It's not something that you typically hear in a news release, and not typically something that a retail investor would would hear. So I think it'll be pretty important for them to kind of understand a little bit high level of what's involved and in all that. Sure. So different places in the world have different requirements of you as a a, a exploration company that works within that jurisdiction. And I'll I'll use Idaho, and Quebec because those are two jurisdictions that we work in. In Idaho, when you have ground and you've completed work, you paid for that work, that's your work. In places like Quebec, you actually file regularly, regularly reports back to the government. So there becomes a library of your completed work and what that means. In the in the US, you'll see a junior come in and pick up ground that was once owned by a different group and they, and they basically have to start from ground zero. They're having to come in, they'll, they'll have to fly airborne again, or they'll have to go to that previous group and buy the airborne data. Uh, the, everything is, unless you've done a deal with the person who had the, that, that, that data set, you, you have to go and generate that. And it's a lot of wasted money in this business, unfortunately. But in places like Quebec, you have a library of that information. So a desktop study for us is gathering every report you can find and you start regionally and then you dr drill it down and tie it into your specific land package. And so you're gathering stuff from different the government offices. Quebec's really good because a lot of stuff is online. We're seeing uh, the historic work. We're then layering our work on top of that. We're seeing the regional work from our neighbors, how that structure is showing up and how it how we we're seeing that structure as it goes through the pinches and swells and folds in that in that structure. What does that mean as it comes in our ground? And so where we've seen big success with Winsome at Canset is their best holes were near the banded iron formations where there was a pinch and a swell where where that fold has happened. It's it's created pressure that was allowed the rock to crack for the pegmatites to come in at a later date and and and, and come into that. So we know there's a correlation between the banded iron and, and the pegmatites. So that's just gathering as much information as you can ahead of going in and spending money with boots on the ground. And so the desktop study for us is bringing everything possible that covers the, the, the entirety of the, the region and then narrowing it into our ground. But also as we're doing that, it allows us to look at neighboring pieces of ground and seeing if it's open or available or is there a conversation that needs to be had to go out and acquire that. So that's what's been happening for the last, well, over a year, but what, certainly what's been happening and coming to the market. Now now that we've completed all our acquisitions, it's time to bring a little bit more of the technical information to the market. And that's why you saw that press release last week. I had a couple people say, why were you quiet? I said, well, why would I give a prospector a reason to add a zero to the ask price? Mm -hmm. Tell them, oh, we've got, you know, uh, 190 exposed pegmatites at surface and there's all these lithium stamps show, showings from the Quebec government. All of a sudden they're they're gonna go from asking for X to X, asking for X plus. Mm -hmm. And they were already doing that. So I didn't need to give them more fuel for that fire. And now we've done that. Now it's time to start bringing the data data out to the to the market and, and not only the historic, but we're now gonna be generating our own from our own program. Awesome. So uh, from that desktop study, uh, you identified uh, 190 known pegmatite outcro uh, outcrops. Uh, at least 17 of those are very robust priority targets. Uh, are you able to speak to, uh, in that desktop study, maybe the size of some of these uh, pegmatites that you may have uh, encountered? You know, Are these in that 500 meter plus range or is still a little bit of work to do there? We're first, we had, when we were flying last fall, when we did the air make, uh, program we had one of our geos in the helicopter for the last two days we were chasing snow flying so we we had a lot of concerns safety wise uh so it was limited limited access limited visibility so what we asked of of, of him was where he saw a pegmatite that they could land safely if he could get out and and, and sample it and map it we literally got out and, and we were able to touch 21 pegmatites 
we know from visuals there was a lot more than that and now we're we've just mobilized our crew or in the midst of mobilizing our crew they're going up in in, in a, a staggered effect but we've got a crew of 20 about to be up there I would be hesitant to give you any type of size or scope with this, the pegmatites until it's been walked on and mapped and sampled by our crew. But we, we, we've got lots of work to do. And, and those 190 pegmatite outcrops that we document, we're only in that original 283 combined square kilometers. Mm -hmm. we, 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 that does not include now the larger land package because that's still now under review as we've added those in in the last few weeks in the last month. So we know the, the, there will be more and we know they come in clusters and, you know, based on the, the the continuing new data that's coming in from from Corvette and and, and from Canset, uh, the the geos are are quite excited about our targets, and we're going to go out and, and and qualify those targets. Right right now, it's about sterilizing the project, put boots on the ground. Where's where's the priority? Where's the the second stage priority? And we're, like where where are we going to come in with and have the most impact with the drill bit? Excellent. So this uh, leads me right into the summer field program, which I think is going to kick off fairly soon. So can you just walk us through some of the work that's planned for the summer and what we may see uh, come sure. the fall or winter? So we have a crew of 20. We have secured bed accommodation and, and, and uh, full lodging at the Mirage Base Camp, which just sits up beside the LG4 airport on the northeast corner of our property, right off the Trans-Tega there. Uh, we've been able to establish a good working relationship with Winsome. Uh, we've been able to agree to try to help share costs where possible. So there's going to be regular chartered flights in and out, bringing supply and people. So we'll be using that uh, with them. And we appreciate that. And Chris Evans, the CEO there, has been really amenable to finding ways to work together. We So in addition to bringing our crew in and out on those charters, we also will be shipping core to the lab or samples to the lab core won't be till the fall but this this spring program we're we're going to our our goal and obligation is to touch every one of those pigmentites with boots on the ground and we want to sample them and map them those samples will come back from the lab and that will then dictate the priority right now we already have 17 ro robust lithium targets but i know we're going to generate more than that there's only so many dollars to go around so we need to really have confidence of those targets There'll be between 3,000 and 5,000 samples taken this spring and summer. And our expectation is we'll be drilling here middle October around Canadian Thanksgiving. Okay, perfect. That leads me into my next question. So working capital, how much working capital are you sitting on currently? And uh, I believe there was an announcement about 4 million private placement. Yeah, so th the bank account today has $2.8 million in the bank. That 4 million takes us up to 6.8 million. The spring programs both in Quebec and in Idaho, because we do have a program that's going to commence there, will be about three and a half million dollars. So we're funded for that without any issue. Uh, as a board, about a month ago, we made, I was marketing in Europe to meet with some of our current shareholders, but also to, to a new audience of investors. And as a board, we sat down and decided that if we didn't like the terms of any future financing, we would fund the next 10 million ourselves. We, that's how much we believe of what's in front of us. So the 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 flow through financing that we're doing right now is is priced at twenty cents, and that will close June eighth, so a week and a half from now. The drill program we expect to see come October is partially funded. If I needed to, I think we could do what we need to with what's in the treasury. But we also have fifteen million dollars of warrant money. There's a bunch of it's already in the money. All of those warrants have call features, so we can actually call and put those on the clock. So they would, uh, and a, a warrant holder would have 30 days from from receiving notice from us to then either exercise or they or they fall away. But management owns roughly 40 percent of those, so we can sell finances through warrant exercise without having to come back to the market. So we, we we're we're comfortable that we have enough in the treasury. To dictate terms on on potential financings, but also the timing of those, but certainly through through a drill program. That drill program in the fall will be a one rig program. We're going to touch a few of those targets. I don't think it makes sense to stay on one. Mm -hmm. We've got we're going to have a bunch. Let's see if we make a, more than one discovery. So I would expect a three to five thousand meter program. You know, 
touching. It's probably but while we wait for the freeze to come in, we'll probably mm -hmm. off of the closest targets to the road so that we can move the rig around as easily as possible for as, long, as far in as possible. And then once everything is frozen, we'll move to, to other targets that are off, off the road, but with winter access becomes easier to move a rig around. Excellent. And what does success look like for Champion in 2023? Geologically or, or commercially? Uh, maybe from a shareholder standpoint. Well, I'm a shareholder, so I'll tell you what my expectation is. I'm expecting a 10x minimum, but I'm speaking as a shareholder right now, not as a CEO. Okay. And from a geological standpoint? We're, I expect to make a discovery of magnitude with the drill bit this year. I expect to see something of similar ilk to what we've seen at, at Winsome and what we've seen at Patriot. You awesome. can see the slides perfect. It shows you the greenstone. Yeah. You can see how it's blazing too, right? Right at the bottom southwest corner of our property. And, and it comes up into our, our ground and then it, 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 the southern flank goes right in to where Patriot is with Corvette and then splays north again up to us on the eastern flank. And I see a lot of pegmatites lighting up that uh, property of yours there. So um, before we kind of wrap things up there, uh, there's a name change and a ticker symbol that was announced yesterday. I believe that's going to happen uh, May 29th. Uh, was there anything you want to share quickly with the viewers regarding that uh, change? Well, prior to the acquisitions in Quebec, we we're Idaho centric and we're not leaving Idaho. We, we think Idaho is a great place to be. And seeing the picture over your shoulder as your backdrop is making me feel homesick because that that's a great part of the world and they're great people. So we're still going to uh, maintain and, and, and have an active presence in Idaho. But now being in Quebec in two jurisdictions, it didn't make sense to keep uh, limiting uh, the opportunity. And with the, the rebrand and pivot, it better reflects who we are as a company mm -hmm. and, and for an investor audience that's trying to figure out where and who and how. I think our name is, is a clearer picture of who we are and where we're headed. The new ticker, I think, takes effect on, on Monday. We, and we, we will have a, a news release with that. Uh, that new ticker is LTHM, so lithium without the vowels. And we will have a new ticker in the U.S., but there's usually a lag of about six weeks, so we don't know what that is. We've submitted five mm -hmm. different tickers. As we did in Canada, we were served five, and then we were able to get the ones we wanted. So we, we were fortunate. I was shocked that LTHM was still available, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, great, grateful to, to have it because we think it's 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 a great ticker. I loved ITKO though; I was a great ticker. I for well, I don't it's, know, it's for to it. Yeah, it's it was it's uh, it was fun with the branding. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun with the branding of the of the new logo and the new name. Absolutely. So I just want to kind of summarize for the viewers, and this is why Champion, in my opinion, is one of my top uh, three lithium juniors. So number one, management speaks for itself. They have a track record in the lithium space. Insiders hold over 30% of the shares and they continue to add to their positions. If we talk projects, so number two, the geology is, is pretty favorable. Massive land package over 500 square kilometers. They're in a tier one jurisdiction. Uh, they're north of the current market darling, Patriot Battery Metals. And uh, from that recent desktop study, you know, there's 900, 190 pegmatites that uh, uh, seem uh, that we're going to hopefully find something on there. And then they're cashed up. So Jonathan mentioned, you know, they're sitting on some money. They got a financing coming up. And then from a, a retail investor standpoint, uh, market cap, it's only about 30 million. I think it's completely undervalued just based on everything that's transpired over the last six months, everything that the company's doing. Um, I don't think it's going to be at this level in the next three to six months. Uh, there is this lithium mania 2.0 that's kind of happening as uh, John Kaiser kind of references. And I think there's going to be a pretty big mad scramble for investors wanting to get a piece of the action, especially in, in what I consider the hottest place for uh, lithium uh, in the world. So um, Jonathan, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, update my viewers on Champion and the projects. Uh, I'm looking forward to some upcoming news releases and company updates. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we kind of wrap things up? We've got a bunch of news to come. I would expect to see news every seven to 10 days once the finances is closed. Obviously, when the finance is open, you can't you can't put any news out. So that 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 will close, I believe it's June 8th. And then you'll start to see data points where you'll see mobilization of crew, what those field programs will be. In Idaho, in Quebec, so you'll you'll get a, an essence and a, a sense of the scale of what we're trying to accomplish. I think as an investor can check those boxes 
I think they'll get they're gonna see how we're gonna grow this. I, I think it's also important for people to appreciate where companies come from. Like Patriot is the market darling right now. That's that's a world class discovery. I think they're gonna end up being still worth considerably more than they are. Mm -hmm. They don't even have a technical report yet, and they're a one point eight billion dollar market cap. Yeah. That's that's a staggering valuation. In November of twenty twenty one, they had about a twenty twenty five million dollar market cap. Mm -hmm. That's great price appreciation for a shareholder. Absolutely. When IPO'd in December of twenty twenty one at a nine million Aussie market cap, they're now about a three hundred fifty million market cap. That's what's possible in this business. It's unique. There's not there may be biotech's the only other sector that can offer you that type of return in that short of a period of time. It's about picking the right jockey and, and the right jurisdiction, chasing the right assets. And, and we think we've got all those pieces. And we think the chart of Winsome and the chart of Patriot is a chart that we can replicate. Awesome. Well, I hope we can uh, do this again. I look forward to uh, some upcoming news. And uh, that's it.